you start off as an undergraduate, which is what most people know, you, you've finished your A-levels or whatever and you apply to a university to do a degree. And that's usually three, three or four years. And then if you show an aptitude for it, you do well in your exams and most of all if you enjoy it. After that you can go on to do postgraduate studies and the most common in research is to do a doctorate, a PhD. Postgraduate degrees, there's two main types. A short one, which is a Master of Science, MSc and a long one which is a PhD which is to study for a doctorate and that's what I did when I was an undergraduate. And you do a PhD in something and you go and work in somebody's laboratory. You're usually doing experiments or doing theoretical studies and at the end of it you write a thesis which is usually somewhere between 50 and 500 pages long and you have to defend that at a viva, um, a viva voce, a, um, an oral examination. And if you've done well the examiners will shake your hand and then say congratulations doctor, whatever else it may be. And at that stage you, know, you are cleared uh, to pass your Doctor of Philosophy degree. If you want to stay in academia, usually the route is to do postdoctoral studies and to be a postdoctoral researcher. Where you would go and work with a professor or a, an academic in a university and do research full time, so you'd be in the laboratory for X number of hours a, a week and writing papers and, and reading a lot about that area of, of, of research. And then uh, there is what's, um, how can I put this, there is the danger of what's become known as the postdoc trap, that you do one postdoc and you get expert in one area but there's no further funding, so you then do a postdoc in another area, if you can find that kind of job, uh, and then you can go on from postdoc to postdoc if you're not careful, and at that stage you're in trouble. Beyond that it gets a bit murky. Right? So there are several routes forward. One is to have your own independent fellowship, okay, which again is usually sort of for between five and ten years. To get a fellowship is actually, it's a really hard thing to do because it's a competition. You know, there's maybe three or four hundred people all competing for perhaps 20, 30 or 40 fellowship positions. So you have to write a proposal and you have to tell the, the people who you're applying to what research you want to do why it's important to do that research and, and why it's important that you're the person to do that research. And there are a whole range of different fellowships, but what the fellowship does is it allows you to get your first step on the academic ladder. So it's almost like <clears throat> a probationary period before you can take on a lectureship or before a university would employ you as a lecturer. Then they probably get a junior lectureship position and uh, that's, that's the start of your independent career. And that's really tough to get into. Uh, wherever you are, whatever subject you're in, that first academic position is really tough. And essentially what you have to do then is, of course you're signed up as a lecturer, so you will have to deliver lectures to undergraduates, but in most universities there is a, a, a clear perception that your job there is to develop your own research interests and start building, planning, funding and managing your own research group. So, so a lecturer is actually what I call the first grown-up job in a university because it's a job essentially which is open-ended in terms of time, so it's a permanent position and you have opportunities to do research so you can take students, so you can take PhD students or master's students and directly supervise their work. Um, after, after that you then start to apply for promotion to go up the academic ladder and it varies in the title on various positions, but usually it's in a three or four stage process. Depends which university you're in, but in most cases you'll have a, a senior lecturer position, so one might think about getting there seven, seven to ten years, I guess, after um, your initial lectureship appointment, perhaps quicker if you, things are going well. After that is a reader, or here it's an associate professor and reader. And then uh, the, the road keeps going on, so you'll be presenting more papers, hopefully you've built up a big group, your, your profile nationally is, is developing into an international profile, you're getting invited to international meetings, then you might think, okay, let's have a crack at going for, for prof. And finally, the top of the scale is professor. Yeah, yeah, it's a big step because you, you're expected to be internationally leading in your research and have a good reputation around the world and a good reputation as a colleague as well. Obviously there are further administrative roles you can take on, you know, you can be head of your division, your school, um, beyond that's the dean, the pro-vice-chancellor and then the vice-chancellor um, who heads all the admin of the university. 
um, if that's the sort of thing you, you want to do. But obviously that's going to take you out of doing research full time. Professor is top of the food chain. So there's one final promotion which comes at the end of the career. So when we retire, if we decide that we don't, we don't want to go and sit in the garden and relax, we can potentially come back to the university as an emeritus professor, and this is a very esteemed position, which I think many people aspire towards, but at the end of the career, I'm not really sure if the appetite's always there. I think in my case, it certainly will be, because like, I'm never happy unless I'm reading and learning. Well, I've just been made a professor, so I'm now a professor of polymer therapeutics. Um, so that's actually great news for me. I'm really delighted about that. Uh, and uh, yeah, so um, as of January the 1st, I became a uh, full professor in the department here. So just before Christmas, I was promoted from lecturer, so the, the bottom of the food chain, one might say, to associate professor and reader, which for me is a big step because it's, it's, it means a lot to, to know that colleagues actually appreciate contribution and that our research outcomes have, have, have made an impact. I'm now, um, instead of being lecturer in physical biochemistry, I'm now associate professor in physical biochemistry. So there's a slight change of title for anybody that reads my email signature <laughs> or pays attention. The process in Nottingham is extremely good. Uh, of course, I would say that because I've just been promoted, but no, it is. It is very good. Uh, it's very clear what you have to do. In some universities, it's a very sort of Byzantine procedure. But in Nottingham, what happens is you apply, so you, you put forward, forward a case for promotion. There's a, a standard deadline um, each year as to when you do that. Um, as an individual, I have to fill in quite a large form. I think it was 25 pages. I have all of mine here and it's uh, not inconsiderable amount of things you've got to write here. Uh, there's about four or five different pro formers. And you're allowed to nominate one referee uh, to review your application. So that would be somebody that you know is in a position of, of expertise in your area who would be best able to judge your work. So when it comes from faculty, it then has to go to another committee, which is a university-wide committee with pro-vice-chancellors, vice-chancellor and a number of other academics on the panel and they make the decision for the university whether my application or my paperwork will be sent out to peers from around the world. You also have three other uh, external referees uh, who are nominated by the university and again they will be um, professors, uh, all these have to be professors and they will be professors from uh, leading UK institutions, or they could potentially be from leading external institutions if they if of the correct level. And about the Monday before Christmas, um, I got a letter uh, addressed to me from the Vice Chancellor congratulating me on my promotion. What was uh, that? Well, it was um, it was it was it was quite quite interesting because it was about two weeks late because apparently they'd had real trouble finding some referees. Um, I found out later. Um, so everybody else had heard beforehand and I had heard nothing, so it's a little bit mm. <laughs> I was sitting in the staff coffee room in the School of Chemistry and um, my head of school, Mark Searle, came across to me, tapped me on the shoulder and asked for a quiet word in the corridor and I thought, oh, what have I done? You know, thinking that I was in trouble or something, something that I'd said or something I'd done. And um, he, when we got to the corridor, he, he tapped me on the shoulder and said, You've just been promoted, mate. Bizarre thing, I was, uh, I was on sabbatical in Australia and New Zealand. Um, I got on a plane between Auckland and Wellington. I had five minutes between the plane there and I had, a, had an intriguing text message about a grant. But of course, I then had to wait 13 hours before I could actually find out whether this grant was funded or not. And I had also had an intriguing message about, call me about your promotion. So I had uh, 27 hours in the air where I couldn't text or ring to confirm anything about this. Um, so when I got back and I was actually able to follow this up, I actually found out from the head of the school that, yeah, my promotion had been granted. So, so double celebrations. I say I got a very nice letter from the Vice-Chancellor, um, which was uh, all nice, in, nice, nice on the heavy gauge paper on ink, <laughs> which made me think that I first got it when I opened it. Because of course, you know, if you get the reject letter, it's always on this very thin, <laughs> thin paper.